Good morning, everybody. As I understand it, our tradition is to walk around the sanctuary with our palms as we hear the music. And uh, let's go clockwise that way so we don't all step on each other. And if you can't, we'll try to not wave them right in your eyes when we go by. Welcome, everyone, and welcome to those online. Welcome. The hearty souls of Guilford Community Church. Anybody come in a snowmobile? Yeah, there wasn't enough snow, right? <laughs> As we gather to worship in this beautiful space, we acknowledge that our church is built on the homelands of the Sokaki Abenaki, who have lived in relationship with this land for thousands of years and are living here still today. We recognize that this acknowledgement is only the beginning of a journey of reconciliation, and we offer our gratitude, respect, and repentance. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Gathering for worship today, we are like the crowd that lined the streets, witnessing your entry into Jerusalem. Some of us gather here full of enthusiasm. Some of us gather wearied by what life has thrown at us. Some of us have come out of curiosity. Some of us have come out of habit. Some of us gather with great expectation. Some of us with no particular hopes. It is a year of God that we need us in the and if we will allow, it is a year that we surprise us with your love and your grace. So open our heavy eyes and tired minds, steal into our closed hearts, and surprise us today with joy. Well, those unrealistic expectations, but open us to the possibility of hope and allow us to glimpse the goodness of your purpose for us. So with cleansed hearts and open minds, 
We join the cry, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Our opening hymn is number 127. Dear God, thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and for your blessings over us. Thank you for the hope that you give us, even through the toughest of times, strengthening us for your purposes. Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you for your mercy and grace as we open our hearts to you in confession. Loving God, even when we cannot name it ourselves, you know what ails us. We submit to your knowledge of us, and we open ourselves to the need for your forgiveness, a forgiveness that comes freely and abundantly. Caught between joy and despair, we yearn for the fulfillment of God's desire beyond the brokenness and neediness of this life. We offer thanksgiving for God's presence with us and petitions for the transformation of our hearts, the church, and the world. Day by day, you sustain us weary with your word and gently encourage us to place our trust in you. Awaken us to the suffering of those around us Save us from hiding in denials or taunts that deepen the hurt. Give us grace to share one another's burdens in humble service. When it seems all hope is lost, God is still working toward restoration. Friends, believe the good news today. Through the Messiah, the righteous branch, our sins have been forgiven and we have been made righteous. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. We want hope to survive in this world today. Then every day we've got.
got to pray on, pray on, if we want hope to survive in this world today. Then every day we've got to pray on. If we want hope to survive in this world today. you guys we everybody has these did you see everybody walking around with them when you came in who can tell me why we have these please isn't it palm sunday yes it's palm sunday and what do you know about what palm sunday means uh, anybody so palm sunday is a day when the people of Israel were really, really excited because they had heard about Jesus and he was coming into their town. And in those days, kings would ride on big horses and they would have armor and a whole army behind them. But when Jesus came into town, he just rode a donkey. So it was pretty low key, except everybody was really excited because they were waiting for somebody to come show them that God was with them. So when Jesus came into town, everybody waved palm branches and said, Hosanna, Hosanna. Does anybody know what Hosanna means? <laughs> Hosanna means help us, save us. So they were praying, right? I always thought that this was like Hosanna meant hooray. <laughs> but it means hooray and Help us! <laughs> so when people are waving the palms, they're praying for God to help them. And people would take palm branches and they would put them on the road so that when Jesus' donkey rode over them, it would be a comfy, clean place. And then people would take the palms and put them by the doors of their house because they were still playing, praying for God to come to them. So when you get home today, you can take your branches and put them outside your door and say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's a way of praying for Jesus to come to your house. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for giving us a physical reminder with our palm branches of what the meaning of this day is, how grateful we are that Jesus came and how we continue to pray to you to help us and save us. Thank you for the gift of this day, and thank you for the gift of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn is 529.
The reading today is from the Psalms, 118, verses 19 to 29. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of God. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is God's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O God. God, we beseech you, you give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in God's name. We bless you from the house of God. God has caused the light to shine on us. Bind the festal, festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to God for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. And the New Testament from Mark chapter 11, verses one through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you. <clears throat> and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near the door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed him to, them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And so ends the reading. May God add his blessing to the holy word. Let us pray. Loving God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. As you all know, Norman Rockwell has tons of famous paintings and because he's from this part of the world, we probably saw, have seen most of them in one form or another. In our living room, we have a print of the one with the people of all the different ages and races with the scripture quote, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Has, is there anybody who's not familiar with that painting? Because I'll bring it in next time. <laughs> You've seen, saw it, right? It's, right. It's, in, it's in the living room at the new house now. <laughs> Did you know that more than a dozen of the world's major religions have a similar verse in their scriptures? Yeah, it seems. Um, a lot of them phrase it this way. What is hateful to you, do not do to others. When I was a kid and a teen, I was really involved in the church. I went to Sunday school. I sang in the choir, the choirs, because we had three choirs. It was really big. Um, I had a well-developed sense of justice issues born out of the understanding of the lessons that I learned in Sunday school. And also my mom used to watch all the news footage of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So I had a firm sense of justice issues from that. 
It was clear to me, although I probably wouldn't have used this language at age five, that Jesus stood on the side of the oppressed. Jesus loved unconditionally. And you know the song, sing it with me. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I took it literally. Good. I really paid attention to the stories of Jesus and how he interacted with people and how he advocated for the oppressed and marginalized in his society. And as a teen and on into college, I was convinced my career was going to be in journalism, exposing the injustices in the world. I would be a truth teller. So off I went to Southern Vermont College to study journalism. My freshman year was the first presidential election I could vote in, and that was the 1980 election between Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, and independent candidate John Anderson. By this point in my life, I was pretty clear that I wanted our politicians to be people of integrity who also advocated for the oppressed and marginalized, or even better, helped build a society that didn't marginalize or oppress people. So in that 1980 election, my lifelong frustration with our political system began. <laughs> in the fall of my second year, which was just the next year after that, I was writing a paper on the Freedom of Information Act and its impact on journalism. And in the process of writing that, I learned about something that had happened when I was only six or seven years old, which was the My Lai Massacre. I remember learning about this and the moment of this epiphany so clearly. I was living in an apartment in Bennington and my bedroom window had a great view of Mount Anthony. I remember, and it was an all-nighter, I was pulling an all-nighter. Ah, those days. <laughs> so fueled by adrenaline and a sense of moral outrage, I remember think, reading about the massacre and thinking in my very utopian, idealistic way, if people of faith just followed their teachings, these things wouldn't happen. I looked out the window and I saw the mountain and I heard a call to ministry. I was being called to tell the truth in a different way. For years, I read and watched and waited would there ever be a candidate who represented my values? This is not all going to be political, by the way, but stay with me. <laughs> Every election felt like choosing the lesser of two evils rather than voting for a candidate I believed in. Until then came Bernie. <laughs> who had been there all along, but, you know. I went to rallies, I went to marches, I donated, I wrote letters, I still have a sticker on my car. I took the kids who were now even old enough to vote themselves, and one time when I was sick, they even went without me. Do you remember that? <laughs> I was so proud that day. I felt like I had succeeded in communicating my values about justice to the next generation. I remember my son John and I driving up to Goffstown on one of the most hot, god-awful days in this room that probably was supposed to fit 300 people that easily had four or 500. And we were in the second row, right on the aisle, better than a rock concert. <laughs> Made me feel so hopeful, so hopeful about a change toward equality and justice. And then the pandemic years came, and my heart was heavy with a sense of horror about what else was going on. Psychologist and author Robert J. Lifton calls it malignant normality, when a situation that's harmful and destructive becomes the norm and becomes accepted behavior. And I found that it was hard for me to feel hopeful when I felt surrounded by greed and dissension and violence and oppression and misogyny and homophobia and racism and xenophobia. When those are the operative values, I began to feel hopeless. There was a point 
that I was really on the edge. And I had a small faith formation group in my Quaker meeting. And I remember one of the folks who is a very, very um, unusual for Quakers, uh, kind of a literal Christian. And she said, can't you just feel the love of God? And it was so hard. It was so hard. There were things going on both personally and politically that just left me walking along that edge of hopelessness. But I named that feeling to them because I think naming it when we have a strong, powerful feeling takes away some of its power when we share it. Naming it to my faith community helped me. They accepted it. They shared my values, which really helped. They reminded me that there's always hope. Desmond Tutu reminds us that hope is being able to see that there's light despite all the darkness. And Thomas Fuller, a 17th century British clergy person and historian said, if it were not for hopes, the heart would break. And I share all this personal history because I'm human, in case you wondered. <laughs> I have both the capacity for joy and hope as well as for grief about the way things are in the wider world. Maybe some of you have felt hopelessness or walked along the edge of it. Maybe you also know the joy of having hope. I love the word elation. I always think of elation when we're doing this. <laughs> Great happiness and exhilaration. It has a lot of energy to it, a lot of feeling to it. And as our scriptures tell us today, into a situation that felt so oppressive, the followers of Jesus began to feel hope and greeted that hope with elation. We know that the people of Israel were suffering under Roman oppression. Historians tell us that on the opposite side of Jerusalem for where, from where Jesus entered, the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, likely entered the city through the Western Gate riding on a war horse with all his armor and his armies holding banners because their job was to keep the peace. All those rabble-rousing Jews are in town for Passover. We got to be here to protect the city. Our scriptures throughout Lent and the prophecies we hear during Advent all talk about a Messiah to come who will save the people. And as we know, and as we've talked about during this Lent, some of the predictions for the Messiah were for a military warrior, a Davidic king-like person. Yet through the Eastern Gate into Jerusalem came Jesus on a donkey. Instead of armor, people put their garments on the donkey for Jesus to ride and threw them in the streets along with palm branches. They're welcoming their royalty. People cried out with a word from their sacred texts, Hosanna, save us, save us now, deliver us, Hosanna. This wasn't a cheer only or just a celebration, it was a prayer. At last, a savior, a new way, the new covenant, our oppression will end and we will be free to live and worship our God. As we heard in Psalm 118 today, the psalmist declares the salvation of God entering through the gates of righteousness. The psalm is a psalm of thanksgiving for deliverance by God and because of its ceremonial language, it was appropriate for use during Passover for a festal procession into the temple. The rejected cornerstone in the psalm refers to Israel being rejected by Egypt, yet now declaring their joy in establishing their own land. Jesus riding through the Eastern Gate was a symbol of entering those gates of righteousness. And the cornerstone quote is now later used by Christian scripture writers to refer to Jesus as the cornerstone. So that's the correlation. So the psalmist is celebrating God's deliverance and conveys trust in God. Earlier, in, prior to the section that we read today, in verse 8, the psalmist says, it's better to find refuge in the Lord than to put trust in humans. 
But this psalm conveys elation, happiness, and exhilaration for the psalmist's salvation by God. Hundreds of years later, the people of Israel were again praying for salvation. So when Jesus enters the city, people who have witnessed his ministry or even heard about it line up to welcome him. They feel hopeless, they feel desperate, and suddenly there's a ray of hope. He's their latest hope. They line the streets to welcome him. Finally, someone will hear us. Finally, someone will show us a better way. Finally, God realizes we need help. Finally, we have hope. There is excitement and joy and anticipation. So I want you to imagine for a moment that Jesus is going to walk through that door. Or that door. <laughs> or that door. What would happen? But you know what? Jesus did. Jesus walked through all those doors today. That one, that one, that one. Maybe came up the lift. <laughs> because there are dozens of Jesuses here. If you're a helper in any way, from praying, to making phone calls, to visiting, to setting up chairs, to taking care of our kids, to making a joyful noise, to baking cinnamon rolls, which was torture because somebody left them in the microwave all week. <laughs> I ex exercise restraint. <laughs> that person was a helper. <laughs> if you reach out to anyone in an act of love and care, you are engaged in the ministry of Jesus. Right? We are to be Christ's hands to heal and Christ's heart to love. So everybody who walked in today is a Jesus. That's not heresy. That's the word of God, right? The spirit dwells within us, whether we call it Jesus or spirit or the God within or Emmanuel. Anytime you stand in solidarity with another human in need, you are engaged in the ministry of Jesus. I've been trying to put my finger on what makes GCC so special. You probably have some theories. I described you all to my daughter-in-law this way. If it was an infrared map, the love at GCC would be a glowing, radiating ball of red. There are folks here who have struggles because there are folks everywhere who have struggles. But I think what makes us different is the pervasiveness of love and care in the community. No matter the struggle, there are folks within this community who can listen or help in some other way, who can validate your concerns, sympathize, or even just sit quietly and hold your hand. Here, you are not alone. And knowing that one is not alone is a seed of hope. This is a poem I saw this week called Instructions on Living in a Broken World. Lean into community, seek out love. Keep paying attention. Talk to your neighbors. Dance to the music. Embrace art. Look for love and small joys. Take breaks and relish in nourishing your body. Donate what you can. Linger at the dinner table with friends. Check in with your people. Let yourself grieve. Love one another as deeply as you can. The storm is upon us and we must hold on. Don't give up, we're here together. Beloved community, let's use this space to uplift, educate, and connect. When Jesus came into his ministry, he formed a community. First he started with his disciples, and then with the people all around them. The community of love and care gathered around Jesus and around his ministry gave people hope. 
St. John of the Cross wrote about the dark night of the soul, describing a person feeling like they're at the bottom of a well, feeling mourning and like God just isn't there for me. And yet when they looked up, they saw a star, a tiny pinprick of light, and realized God was there with him all along. That's hope. Remember in Advent when we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel? Did you sing it this past year? You will next year, because that's one of my favorites. <laughs> Emmanuel means God with us. We may still have struggles, but we are never without hope because we have each other. We have God with us, a community founded in the life, work, and ministry of Jesus. So blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed are you all who come in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Jesus, no man. So today we lift up in prayer Peter, who's homesick, um, and Larry and Ellen. Larry left a message saying, we can't get off the mountain. <laughs> and Catherine just said, it's too snowy. Are there other folks we lift up in prayer today? We have prayers for Joy, that's right. Um, Joy Hayes fell this week and spent some time at Cheshire and was going to be sent to rehab. I don't have an update in the last 24 hours, but I'm hoping they didn't try to move her yesterday. Um, nothing was broken, just a lot of bruising and some complications due to medications at Cheshire. Prayers of healing for Jim Haynes. Prayers for peace. Connie. Prayers for my mother, Alice. Tony Parks. I'm sorry? For Tony Parks. Tony Parks. Jack? Prayers of celebration and gratitude for the small choir that sang so joyously at Langdon Place. Prayers of joy and gratitude for the small choir singing at Langdon Place. Prayers for Mary Ellen Colbert. 
Prayers for Mary Ellen Kohler. Okay, thanks, Julie. Prayers of gratitude for peacemakers around the world and give them strength to serve the suffering and to try to bring a cease to hostility in numerous places in this world. Prayers of gratitude for peacemakers. Prayers for my friend Dale Driscoll. Dale Driscoll. Fell and broke both her ankles. Oh. Elizabeth. Prayers for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Prayers for those mourning the loss of loved ones. Diane Larson. Right. Including our beloved Diane Larson Freeman and her family. Let us pray. Holy One, we lift up to you today those who stand in need of your mercy and your healing, your light and your hope. We give you thanks and praise for the joys and blessings in our lives, for song and prayer and peace. And we ask you to stand with us when we're reluctant or afraid to follow the path of Jesus, give us the strength of your assurance. When we're afraid, give us courage and strength. When you feel alone, remind us that we belong to you and to each other, that our hearts may be ever filled with hope. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power When we stop to recognize the amazing gift of Jesus, the one who fully embodied God's love, our natural response is gratitude. We symbolize our gratitude with our offerings today.
Loving God, as we bring our gifts, we remember the crowds in Jerusalem who laid their cloaks on the road shouting Hosanna as Jesus passed. We know they were looking for a Messiah who was very different from the one you sent Jesus to be. May our gifts reflect our commitment to the ongoing hope, healing, love, and salvation shown to us in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please turn and greet your neighbor with the sign of peace. Our closing hymn is number 416. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We have announcements. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to let you know, because some people tell me they miss it, there is a new issue of Hoverings, our quarterly newsletter. It's in the e-news. So if you go to the e-news and you look for the black and white angel logo heading, you click on the link there and you'll get the quarterly newsletter.
Hi, I'm Robin Davis, and this coming Thursday is Maundy Thursday. We're having a um, service. Is it downstairs? And um, um, we're having a little modest supper that, to go with that, and um, it's going to be sort of like a potluck soup thing and bread. Um, it won't be dessert, just soup and bread. And so um, I'm taking names of people that might want to make soup or bring a loaf of uh, fresh bread. See me after downstairs. Thanks. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I finally got more tickets. So please see me at coffee hour for the 5050 raffle. And what are they, what, what are they supporting? Um, they're, they're supporting the, the conference for, uh, for people who have disabilities. So it's, it's called um, Voices and Choices. Hi, I'm Carol Crompton, and I'm one of the deacons. Hi. Carol Crompton, one of the deacons. Still more? Okay, there we are. I'm trying. I'm not one of you professionals here. I'll go down like this. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm, and I, um, we deacons decided we needed new name tags, so I've been making them. And if you, it, uh, no big deal. Um, it, it, it's not really, it's a computer thing, it's fast. But I may have missed some of you. And we ran out of pockets for, um, for them. So if you have an extra pocket at home, you could bring one back, and we can fill all the ones that are on the back there. And if you don't see your name on the, they're in alphabetical order, try to put them back. That way we don't expect it, but we hope it. <laughs> hope. <laughs> um, anyway, um, pockets. Bring the back pockets so we have more. Thank you. Uh, Brian Reamer, I want to just uh, let you know that uh, Saturday we have uh, the Guilford Easter Treasure Hunt. will be happening out here in the um, in the park, and so I hope that you all will tell your friends and neighbors to bring their children age three to 13 and the friends of, that those children have uh, come at three o'clock. And the, if you know of teenagers, uh, particularly those who are part of our, our youth group or who want to help hide the treasures, that will begin at one o'clock, is that what we said, Nancy? Yeah, at one o'clock, ask them to come a little bit earlier so they can hide the treasures. Um, if you'd like to help out in other ways, we are looking for donations of, excuse me, baked goods that we can have available uh, by don donation. Um, and otherwise, if you'd like, just like to come and be a part of the festivities, um, just you're welcome to come and, and be a part of the festivities. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Judy Seiler, and I just wanted to let you know that we have the quilt. We're starting the raffle early this year, and if anybody wants to buy raffle tickets um, in coffee hour, we've we've got them, have them available. And hope you guys enjoy it. And we tell everybody, touch the back; it's real soft. Yes. So, <laughs> all right. Quick one this time: if you don't read your e-news or you don't get your e-news. The Sugar on Snow Supper raised $3,272, which was above budget. So. Which was what? Which was what? Above budget. Um, I'm just going to go through the Holy Week events in order. Um, so Thursday, 6 o'clock. Soup and bread, communion supper downstairs. We won't be coming up here. Um, we'll be incorporating scripture and food and communion at the end um, downstairs. And see Robin if you want to donate soup or bread. Friday at 7 p.m. at the Dummerston Church, 
the four UCC churches, um, us, Center Church, uh, West Brattleboro and Dummerston, are all putting together a Union Good Friday service that starts at 7 p.m. at Dummerston. Saturday at 3 o'clock is the Easter treasure hunt. And Sunday we have um, sunrise service at 6.30 out back with a fire, uh, followed by breakfast, followed by 10 o'clock worship. Yeah. 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 Choir practice at eight thirty. Still. Okay. All right. That day. Easter day. Easter day. Right. Um, do we have birthdays? Alan and then Elizabeth. Myself and Paul have birthdays this week. Alan and Paula have birthdays this week. Very exciting. Anniversary next week. Wow. That's a lot of cell. I see cake in your future. <laughs> Yeah, Elizabeth. My son Matthew was 44 yesterday. Wow. And Jimmy Doubleday, I don't know how old she was, but she had a birthday <laughs> on Friday. Matthew and Judy, <laughs> happy birthday. Jack. My brother Charles Wesley on March 21st caught up with his sister in law Julie and turned age 74. Ah, Charles Wesley, a good Methodist name. <laughs> Other birthdays. All right, let's sing. Happy birthday, happy birthday, we love you. Happy birthday, and may all your dreams come true. When you blow out the candles, one light stays in glow. It's the love light in your eyes wherever you go. Amen. Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna. <laughs> <laughs>